everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on Rashpixel.fm. I'm Pete Wright, and right over there, it's Nikki Kinzer. Well, hello, Pete Wright. Hello, Nikki Kinzer. How are you? I, I'm great. How are you? I Every time we have a great guest on the show, I am fan Fantastic, And we have a fantastic guest on the show today, and we're going to talk all about the pre- and post-diagnosis and how, specifically, your ADHD journey can change radically as a result. Before we dive in, head over to TakeControlADHD.com. You can get to know us a little bit better. You can listen to the show right there on the website or subscribe to our mailing list right there on the homepage. That's definitely the best way to do it. Sign up. You get an email every time a new episode or new resource is released each week. You can connect with us on Twitter or Facebook at Take Control ADHD and call us, leave us a voicemail at 503-664-4ADD and get your voice, your thoughts, your questions right here on this very show. We would love to hear from you. Our guest today is the one and only mess to success ADHD productivity coach, Alan Brown. He's the host of Crusher TV at CrusherTV.com, the creative force behind ADD Crusher, the award-winning video series for ADHD teens and adults, undiagnosed for decades, His untreated ADHD manifested in underachievement and failed relationships and substance abuse and worse, he says. Once diagnosed, he found it difficult to learn coping strategies from books, so he developed his unique brain hack strategies while building a successful advertising career and several startups. And that's why he's here today. Alan Brown, welcome to the ADHD podcast. Thank you for joining us. Fantastic to be here with you too. This is, we want to talk about the the pre and post diagnosis journey. Nikki, would you kick us off this, because this is something that you deal with working with your own coaching clients every day. How would you like to frame up this conversation with Alan? Well, yes, I know that for, for by the time that people come to me for coaching, they've already had the diagnosis. And so, um, a lot of times what, and, and sometimes it's brand new and sometimes they've, they've known about it for a long time. And, uh, a lot of times I'll ask them, well, how did you feel when you got the formal diagnosis? And many of them will say, in fact, I would say most of them will say relieved, but then there's also this fear that, okay, now that I know this, I know maybe it's not my fault and everything starts to make sense. And it's a little more clearer why I do what I do. They still don't really know what it means or exactly how to manage it, which is why they've, you know, come to coaches and therapy and, and everything else that they do to try to, to take control of it. So I'm really curious from, from you to start off the conversation is what you're seeing in the pre-diagnosis part of it. I think the pre-diagnosis, uh, uh, years for me uh, were very formative, uh, malformative, you might even say. And, um, you know, I we, knew, we do maybe need to make a distinction because, as you say, Nikki, a lot of people that come to you have already known that they're ADHD. They may have been diagnosed at the age of 8 or 12 or 13. But I think for a lot of folks uh, like Pete and myself, where we didn't get diagnosed until our 20s or 30s or 40s, and I just met a guy the other day who was diagnosed at 80. Wow. And he's wow. now 87. He says that the last seven years were the best years of his life. So there's a, a positive, there's a happy oh. story. Mm-hmm. I can totally but, relate to that. That's amazing. Yeah. And I was diagnosed at 36. And um, so I'm a few years older than that now. I've had quite a few years uh, working with ADHD clients and um, uh, working in the ADHD world generally to kind of to have a nice view of this overall journey. And I would say that the undiagnosed years are really, um, I call it undiagnosed and at risk. And I actually did a TEDx talk, uh, on that, which I'm sure you'll, you'll put into the, to, to the show notes. But, uh, you know, when you are undiagnosed as an adult, you are walking around, um, getting conditioned to maybe think that you're not as smart as you thought you were. Mm -hmm. This is a big, big thing. I mean, my, I thought my name growing up was dummy. Because I, every time I screwed something up, my father would be like, oh, you dummy. Why did you do this? You did this again. You smacked up the car or you broke this. or, And so that can really have a huge impact. So that's why I kind of call this, you know, the undiagnosed and at risk and also the conditioning phase. And Alan, Alan I got to ask, were you seeking a diagnosis when you were diagnosed? Yes. When I was diagnosed, I was seeking it until I was 36. I had no idea. Yeah. Uh, at all. And I certainly had no idea in school. I grew up, uh, I was a, a teenager in the in the 70s and 80s where, you know, ADHD wasn't really talked about at all. Nobody really knew about it. Yeah. 
So, yeah. I, well, and I, I bring that up because, uh, you know, I'm I'm of the other path. I didn't even know I was going to be diagnosed. I was in it for, for marriage counseling, uh, you know, years ago. And, and our therapist said, you know, your marriage is fine. But Pete, let's talk about your ADHD. That's the first time I'd ever even heard of it. And suddenly, suddenly the, the, it's like the sun rose. It was unbelievably illuminating for me. Uh, but but you're right. I mean, those those at risk. I love the way you say that undiagnosed and at risk. Those years are incredibly uh, they're dangerous. And and you say dangerous. And that's not overstating it, because uh, for me personally, um, the kind of the next phase for me in my pre-diagnosis was um, after the self-doubt of, uh, you know, thinking that I maybe I am a dummy. Maybe I'm not as smart as I thought I was. I started hanging around with the with the wrong uh, kids in high school. Um, and oh, they're great guys. I'm still best buddies with them back in Jersey, but uh, we were doing bad stuff. And then it got to kind of a self-medication. Um, there's where the real danger is. And I was self-medicating for a better part of my twenties. Um, I was uh, abusing alcohol. I was, um, uh, I was not smoking a lot of weed, but I started doing Coke. And then uh, in order to try to put myself through college, uh, I started dealing drugs, and then of course I became a drug addict because when you're when you're doing your own drugs as a drug dealer, you, you, your business doesn't last very long. That's one. That's a lesson you only learn once, right? Well, <laughs> well it did take me ten years to learn. It. <laughs> so I guess that was one lesson, but it was a long lesson. But yeah, dangerous is not overstating it, and uh, we know. And I talked about this in my TEDx talk that there is a disproportionate number of uh, undiagnosed ADDers in jail. Forty three percent of the prison population, the nonviolent prison population, is uh, uh, known to be uh, ADHD, undiagnosed. And so, you know, it is a dangerous place to be if you are doing some of the wrong things. Well, and, you know, something I want to add, you know, the, the month of October is ADHD awareness. And, uh, one of their themes is knowing is better. And I, I definitely think you are hitting that point very clearly that knowing that you have, this is going to be better for you. Yeah. If, if we were able to, you know, think about this, there are 9 million ADHD adults in the U.S. alone, 85% of whom don't know their ADHD. So they're wandering around in this conditioning and or self-doubt and or self-medication world where they just have no idea why they are the way they are. And, uh, you know, hopefully at some point they'll come across a marriage counselor, as you did, Pete, who will say, hey, you know, let's take a look at you. Or as happened with me, I was working. I finally got off the drugs and got a job in the advertising business at the age of 29, entry level job. And uh, a few years in, my boss was diagnosed with ADHD only because his son was diagnosed with ADHD. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this story, you guys have heard this story where, you know, a parent you know, is having uh, 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 has a child who's having trouble in school. The child gets diagnosed. They hear these stories. They see the patterns. It's borne out by the doctor's uh, diagnosis and description of it. And the parent goes, "Oh my goodness, I, I realized this is was me when I was in school. Wow!" Mm -hmm. And so the parent then goes gets the diagnosis. So my boss was my surrogate, just as my boss's child was his surrogate, and that's how I finally got diagnosed. Well, and that's an amazing, uh, amazing sort of transformation anyway, right? It's that, it, it's that, you know, in terms of you seeking it, you certainly weren't seeking it when you watched your boss go through it. Do you, do you, you know, when you think back on that experience of, of, you know, your boss coming to you and telling, to you, telling you, Hey, I just got diagnosed. Do you remember what that felt like? Yeah, it was, it was one of those, Oh my God, this, well, he described, uh, his child's, uh, issues. And then he described his own, going to school. He was from New York, New York area too. Um, and he described, you know, kind of doing these things, having trouble at school, uh, not being able to read very well. And I said, man, well, that, that, that was me too. Um, the, the really kind of tragic thing, and this is, I think, important for our listeners too, is at this time, and I think this was back in 92 or something like that, I, you know, here I am working at a big ad agency in New York City, and I go to my doctor at the time, this is on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, a well-educated man. And I say, hey, doc, I think I might have ADHD. What do you think? And my doctor said, and I quote, Alan, ADD is a myth created by the media. 
Oh. That's what he said. And yeah. he said, Alan, you're, you're in your early 30s. What you really need to do is just do more crossword puzzles. Sure. No. Oh, I, I kid you not. And so I listened to him because we listen to doctors, right? When doctors say yeah. something, we go, wow. It's a, so I ended up getting very good at the New York Times crossword puzzle. <laughs> that if you do this, it will all go away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Who knew this is what inspired the crossword cartel in, in our country? <laughs> it's all this false ADD information. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I went another, I think, five years um, just assuming that this guy was right and that I just needed to do more crossword puzzles. And I was here I am trying to kind of make up for lost time because I had lost. 10 year, pretty much 10 years of my life as, as a drug addict and a, and a criminal and a ne'er-do-well. I could tell you stories that will raise the hairs on, on the back of your neck. But I was busting my butt in the advertising business and getting very, very average returns. Again, I was thinking, okay, I'm 30-some years old. All these other people that are at my level, they're 7, 8, 9, 10 years younger than me. I should be able to kind of with my streets, you know, street smarts and my life experience should be able to blast by all these people. Well, I was getting my butt kicked. I was like the old lady in, in the 1972 Nova in the passing lane with her blinker on and everybody's honking at me and passing me on the right. <laughs> because I'm just oblivious and they're they're like who who is this older guy who just can't get out of his own way. So that was that was brutal. And then what happened was I I my first marriage fell apart and uh, ADD was certainly uh partly to blame blame for that. And uh, so I'm I'm living uh, alone in the East Village of New York and I'm reading the uh Village Voice. I think this is 1997. And the Village Voice is kind of the, the, the hip news, the free newspaper in the East Village at the time. And the back page of, of which is called the, uh, the Bulletin Board. And it's just a bunch of free ads. And there was this ad for the Manhattan uh, ADD, uh, adult ADD support group. And they're still going. They've been going since like 91. They're still going. And uh, there's an ad that said, this week's presentation, doctors who get it and doctors who don't. And I oh. said... Oh, my goodness. You mean, so my doctor might have been just a bonehead? So I went to this me- I went to this meeting, and sure enough, the lecturer stood up there and, and said, you know, only X percent of the medical community is bought into this. The rest of them think that ADHD is a myth created by the media. Oh, jeez. <laughs> And do and, more crossword puzzles. Uh. And do more crossword puzzles. So, so um, at that time, by that time, I was at a new ad agency, and of course, had a new doctor. And I went to that doctor and I said, "Listen, doc, do you get it or do you not get it?" And she said, "Oh my goodness, I've got a 21 year old son who's a classic case, and we've gotten him treated." And blah blah blah. Let's shoot, let's put you through a battery of tests to make sure it's not something else. And man, she put me through like five different tests, hearing tests. Uh, there's a certain virus at the back of your eye that can cause ADHD type symptoms, sleep diagnosis. She put me through everything. And my last stop was a psychiatrist um, on the Upper West Side of uh, Manhattan, who, after talking with me for about seven minutes, said, hold on, Alan, hold on. Yeah, you, you're, you're a classic case. OK, <laughs> here's your here's your prescription. <laughs> when they start writing textbooks about it, your name will be in it. That's how textbook you are. You can look up bad ADHD and, and maybe see a picture of me. I don't know. But <laughs> you can also, um, and we'll get into these other phases of this pre and post-diagnosis uh, journey. But this is this one, the diagnosis phase of the journey for me was one where the light bulbs, you know, as you were saying, Nikki, the light bulbs just kind of go off. And, oh, my God, this explains so much. And I'm so relieved. And maybe I'm not a dummy. And maybe I can stop wasting my Saturday mornings on that brutal Saturday New York Times crossword puzzle, which is even tougher than the Sunday puzzle. <laughs> the lessons you learn in going through your ADHD journey. <laughs> That's actually where I, I, I would love to pivot. And, and you know, insofar as you know, your story is a great model of, of diagnosis, and we talk about that, it, it is a, a shame that the people who listen to our podcast generally find us because they've already been diagnosed. The people who really need to hear that story are the people who aren't listening to us yet. So uh, here's to all, I'm raising a glass to all those people who are going to be listening to the show in a year or five years or 10 years who have just gotten diagnosed. And hopefully this next part of the conversation uh, w- will help you see where to go next. 
Well, and Kate, before we pivot to that, I just want to say one thing real quick about women and getting diagnosed with ADHD, because I just did an interview this week talking about this. And one of the things that was brought up in the interview was how they are typically diagnosed with anxiety and depression first before they get the diagnosis of ADHD or that that's a risk that they can run Mm -hmm. um, of getting misdiagnosed. And so one of the things that I was talking to the um, interviewer about was, you you know, I think being your own advocate too, like going into the doctor and saying, okay, these are the symptoms and then seeing what they have to say. And if it doesn't sit right, because I'm just, I, I really believe you have to listen to your intuition and what, what makes sense. And if it doesn't sit right, that it's just, you know, this, I did been taking the antidepressants and it's still not getting better. Um, I've changed this and it's still not getting better, you know, to keep pushing for that. And I'm not saying that it's necessarily an ADHD diagnosis that you're looking for, but anything, just keep being your own advocate until something does make sense. I'm so glad you brought up the issue of women and ADHD. Um, I also talked about this in my, in my TEDx talk where women have um, an extreme set of their own issues. Uh, there was a big study done at Berkeley some years ago that's called the, the Women in ADHD Study, and uh, it shows the, the inc- disproportionate number of uh, suicide attempts, eating disorders, depression, as you say, and on and on and on for women with ADHD. And the, te- and the survey was done among, a- among diagnosed women, so mm-hmm. asking what it's like for undiagnosed. But I think the, the key thing that you're, you're pointing to here is being your own advocate. And I was just going to say kind of the same thing, which is a lesson learned from here, from my experience with this doctor saying it's a myth created by the media. Um, first of all, respect your doctor, but know that doctors don't know everything and insist on getting the opinion of a specialist because there are a lot of um, – you know, general practitioners out there who aren't boned up enough on ADHD and who will either dismiss your ADHD or they may just say, yep, okay, here's your prescription for Ritalin, go get him, Tiger, which right. is also not really good because you could be missing a diagnosis of an underlying depression or sleep disorder or uh, a bunch of other things. But the other thing that I want to quickly insert is for those who have been diagnosed, diagnosed, um, particularly those recently, and those who have been prescribed some kind of medication and found that it didn't work or it produced some side effects or it wore off after a while, don't then accept the assumption that, well, I tried meds and they didn't work because there are many kinds of meds, there are many uh, different um, ways to administer them, and everybody's body chemistry is different. So I it took three different mixed uh, cocktails of medications when I was first diagnosed before we landed on one, my doctor and me, before we landed on one that actually works. And I've had that same prescription for 20 years. And I can tell you as when we do pivot into the, the other side of diagnosis that my use of that prescription has declined every year. Uh, for the fa- past 10, 15 years, where I'm just using less and less and less because of the things that I'm doing. So just mm-hmm. to just to wrap that thought up, if you have tried meds or you're f- frustrated with your current meds, go back to your doctor and say, hey, I want this treatment to work, but this particular one is not working, and don't be shy about it. And if your doctor, if you're not happy with the doctor, go find another one, ideally a specialist. Uh, so let's talk uh, then. Can, is it okay that we pivot uh, a little bit pivot, more? Pivot, Pete. Okay. You can pivot. I want to pivot. I want to pivot now. I, I want to pivot to the the post uh, diagnosis journey because that's where if you if you are new to this show, if you're listening to the kinds of stuff we talk about, we are all about how to make your life better once you are aware uh, that you are going through the AD, you're on the the ADHD road, uh, and and so you know for those in terms of the the process, if we're looking at it uh, in terms of the the steps of awareness of awaken, awakening uh, to ADHD, what is the what is the, the the sort of first step of awareness that once you've gone through it, let's say you talk to your doctor as you are adjusting to life with ADHD from, from your experience, Alan? Yeah, well, for me, it was a, a very positive one where I, it was excitement and uh, total acceptance. I had no, you know, there wasn't any of the denial or the shame or the fear or those, you know, those kind of classic 
um, you know, psychological uh, phases that uh, Nikki may see in some of her clients. But um, I, I ran out immediately and bought a bunch of books on adult ADHD coping strategies. There were a, a good number of them back then. Um, but uh, <laughs> I bought about five books and then I got home, opened the first book and then remembered that, ah, that's right, I can't read. <laughs> I was just going to say, that's probably uh, probably a thing that isn't going to work all that well when you, you just wake up to ADHD. So, yeah, so this actually kind of gets into, you know, one of your best kind of next steps is to just get wise on the condition and on your own uh, brain wiring. Uh, for instance, I did a little research and found out that, wow, 30% of ADDers are dyslexic and the majority of the other 70% have terrible reading comprehension. So I'm not very dyslexic. I have some mild, you know, letter swapping and stuff. But my problem is I can read the same paragraph three times in a row and go, what did I just read? And that's because of my inattentiveness. So the more you know about your own brain and importantly about your own processing styles, uh, the better it can be. But, you know, Nikki might be able to speak more to those folks who got the diagnosis and said, oh, no way, or now I hate myself or you know, now I'm less than. Well, it's interesting because I think that that's definitely where they're, that's what they're feeling. And, and I see a lot of like fear of just, okay, what does this really mean then? If I have this, what does it mean? It, 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 do, is there still hope, you know, is there hope for me? Because at this point they probably have felt pretty hopeless about it, or they've been told those negative messages that you're lazy. Why can't you just do it? Just do it. You know, all of that. It's pretty easy to stop and say, okay, just because you can define it and put words to what I'm experiencing doesn't mean I'm fixed. Right. And I think that, um, one of the most powerful messages that that I try to send to my clients when they're feeling this way and and they seem to all respond to it is just letting them know this is not your fault. You're not broken. There isn't anything wrong with you. And a lot of times I'll use the analogy of, you know, say that you've got one person who uh, doesn't have ADHD and you have the other person who has ADHD and you guys are both going to the same destination. So the person with a- or without ADHD, you know, has a map. They know where they're going. They get there. They get there on time. It's a pretty straight shot. Well, the person with ADHD... They may have a map, but they're going to, you know, kind of take their time. They might stop at a rest area and they might sightsee. Uh, they might have some lunch. They may go visit a friend, you know, or they may decide to go a completely different way. They still get there. They just do it on their own. They, they do it their own way. And, um, and that's how I explain it is that, you know, you can still do everything that you want to do. Let's just look at it though, the way your brain is wired and it's not your fault. And that tends to at least kind of get them to, to shift that mindset of it's not just me. Yeah. You know, I, I like the idea or the metaphor of the road, because I feel like walking on a road, at least for me, once I was aware of the fact that this thing was happening to me, or I'd been experiencing this thing, I'm walking on the road and then I come up to this giant valley and it is a valley where the the walls up on the sides are, are like in flames. And it's, it is, you know, paved with, uh, you know, thumbtacks point up, you know, and I had to go through this valley. It's the valley of despair. Right. And I, I had to go through that bit of, awareness and shame and because suddenly once you once I was aware that there was a word to this thing that I was experiencing that this is what you know I I had seen in the kids I'd grown up with years before who said oh I've got ADHD and I'm trying to trying to live with it once I came to those words I was like oh great now everyone I look at everyone I work with I am judging myself against them through the lens of ADHD and what are they able to do? What are they capable of in their lives that I am simply not capable of doing? Mm-hmm. And that is an incredibly painful uh, valley to walk through. But once you get a handle of it, in, in my experience, and as I sort of learned the tools to, to sort of get to the other side of it, I, you can climb out of the valley and it turns out it's just a road up from there. Once you understand how to live with and how to use your ADHD, I think it's it, it and, and how to how to uh, your own accommodations and requirements to get through the same things that you used to do painfully before it actually can be a very positive shame free experience uh, uh shame free is is well said and uh the this i would call this phase once you kind of get yourself sorted and 
and you know you get a good view of the valley, so to speak. This is your rebuilding phase. This is where you go, okay, I'm going to work to understand my own brain. I'm going to find out how to get down that road quickly if I want to, or enjoy the road a little bit more, the scenic, uh, the scenic route, if you will. Um, and the, the more you try, you rebuild, and this is with coping strategies, this is working your diet, exercise, and sleep, which are the first things I teach uh, to any client. Um, and you start to maybe put together some brain hacks that help you uh, uh, kind of compensate for your different wiring, you can actually start to see the gift of ADHD. And, you know, it's funny, I, I just was uh, invited uh, last night to speak to SEAL Team 6 about, um, these. I don't know if you, you guys know these, this is oh, a, yes. a elite uh, Navy uh, guys that um, go on these special ops. They took out Osama bin Laden, yada, yada. But these guys are disproportionately ADHD, and it affects their lives in a number of different ways. But here's a classic example of the gift of ADHD. People, when they are hiring, when they are looking to recruit people for SEAL Team 6, and the same goes for Special Forces. I was just talking with a, a medic with, uh, in Special Forces in the Army just uh, the other day. They actually profile for this this brain wiring, the, the, the people who can uh, do synaptic thinking or lateral, what's called lateral thinking, meaning think outside of the box and come up with a solution that like nobody, no linear thinker would ever have thought of. But it does, of course, still come with its issues. And um, one of the reasons I'm speaking to these guys is because they have issues in their relationships and they have issues getting their, you know, their banking done and their errands done and stuff, just regular life stuff. But you start to see as you move through this journey, this balance of the curse and the gift. And if you keep working the right stuff, self-awareness, understanding your brain, brain hacks, diet, stuff like that, listening to podcasts like this, um, you will start to see eventually a tipping point where you're, you know, initially your curse was 90% of your life and the gift of ADHD was maybe 10% to where it's getting closer to 50-50. And then you can get to the, you know, the phase that I call the gift, which is now you're at 51-49 or 60-40. Um, and uh, that is a beautiful place to be. And, and, if, and if I had to leave the, the audience with one thing, it is know that that is possible if you just keep at it and uh, keep your nose to the grindstone and, and keep working strategies. That's amazing. Uh, I, not only uh, it, it's inspirational to think about your message, but that the that the special forces and and uh, SEAL Team Six that they are disproportionately ADHD. I had never made that connection before. That's unbelievable. Uh, and a reason a reason that they that they are is because the ADD brain is a risk taking brain. Mm -hmm. We don't have uh, the regular. We don't have the normal stores of dopamine, uh, adrenaline. Uh, norepinephrine, et cetera, to make us get up and go do the laundry. We, we, we need more of a jolt, more of a, a reason to go do things. And so these guys, you know, and gals, they would never in a million years end up in a cubicle somewhere because they, their brain just won't do it. So they end up going into the military um, and into and, and then signing themselves up for these high risk taking th things because this gives them the, the the dopamine that they didn't other otherwise have. And I'm not saying that's the only reason they go and sign up for this stuff, but it definitely is a brain characteristic that makes it appealing to them. Appealing and makes them particularly it, it celebrates a strength that they have that others, you know, it may be more challenging to to cultivate. True, and you know. Even in my struggling years of advertising, as I mentioned, the first five or six years of my advertising career, I was busting my butt. I'm working late hours. I'm working every Saturday, and I'm scratching my head going, I just don't understand why I can't get any traction in this career. I, yeah. I know that I'm really not a dummy, and there are a few things I do well. Well, one of the things that I could do really well was brainstorm. And for instance, I was at this ad agency that had blue chip clients like Nabisco and Colgate Palmolive, um, where we were doing things like coming up with names for new candies or uh, uh, different flavors for gums, just wacky brains. And they would always say, whenever somebody had a brainstorming project, well, let's get that bonehead Alan Brown in here. He can't, <laughs> he can't do much, but he definitely can brainstorm. And if you just give him a couple slices of pizza, he'll happily come. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so this was this was a strength of mine. And, and, and a key to ADHD success is knowing your strengths, right. knowing your weaknesses, and then play into those strengths. Easier said than done, <laughs> but it's an absolute key. Well, and I think it's important that they build awareness about about what their strengths are, because a lot of times they don't see them. So bringing that out in them too, you know, asking them questions of when did you succeed? And it's so interesting to me when they have seen success, but they don't remember it or they, they, they downplay it. And so I think as a coach and um, as people who support ADHD, it's important for us to make sure we highlight those things so they do see it. Yeah, we all we all have what's called the negativity bias, where um, negative uh, experiences and memories have more sticking power in our brain, and that's to help us survive. Right? We don't mm-hmm. want to be walking through the the jungle, skipping and whistling, going "Everything's fine," and then you know a boa constrictor, you know, or a lion jumps out. But we ADDers, in part because of our our conditioning. Uh, and the self doubt that was sown where, well, you know what, I'm a dummy and, uh, you know, I just screw everything up or I can't perform the way that my colleague can, et cetera. We tend to view, um, negatives even more than our successes. So for instance, you know, we could have three success, great successes in one day, but one negative, right? One quote unquote failure. And that one failure will outweigh the three negatives. We don't even remember, I'm sorry, it will outweigh the three positives. We don't, won't even remember those positives, but we will carry that one little quote unquote failure with us all day, all week long. And it's, mm-hmm. uh, you, you nailed it, Nikki. It's, it's something that when you get more aware of, you can, you can start to try to deal with. You had mentioned that the first thing that you do with your clients when you are in that rebuilding stage is talk about self-care. And I know that a lot of times that isn't the first thing that's on their mind. Can you just talk a little bit about where to start with that or how to how to go about that? You bet. I mean, look, let's let's face it. You get diagnosed with ADHD and you start to tally all of the miseries that this has been responsible for. And you want some fixes, man. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of cases, medication, proper medication treatment can make a huge difference just in your ability to, you know, stay on a task and have, you know, motivational energy, et cetera. And so we, we will tend to kind of look for, well, what's the solution here? You know, what's a, what's a coping strategy? Um, How do I manage time better? Well, you know, diet, exercise, and sleep are not sexy. And so, and also we don't tend to realize the power of these things. So the first thing that I will tell anybody uh, with ADHD is sugar sucks, carbs kill, protein is power, and omegas are mega, right? Very ADD friend. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why do I say this? Because we ADDers are trying, undiagnosed especially, we are out there trying to fire up our brains with things. We self-medicate not just with caffeine, which is not a bad thing, not just with nicotine, which is a bad thing, and not just with drugs, which is a horrible thing, but we self-medicate with sugar, and also with carbs, because uh, simple carbs in particular. Let's think about a Mountain Dew or a, or, a, or a Coca-Cola, which has sugar and caffeine. And if I can bang that down in the morning, I can get these little bursts of mental energy that make me feel for a brief time that I don't have ADHD. But the problem is that because you're delivering that glucose to your brain so quickly, um, it burns off very quickly. And the same thing happens with crackers, potato chips, and other simple carbs. So if you were to just acknowledge that and instead switch to a protein breakfast, ideally a plant protein breakfast, like 30 grams of protein, you would find that you're able to, your brain is able to go until like 11 o'clock instead of that 9.15, wow, my brain's crashed already. I need some more Mountain Dew. This is a key thing. I know Countless people in the advertising business, undiagnosed ADHD, as much as I've tried to help them understand that you might be ADD, they are still walking around with a big jug of Mountain Dew or Diet Coke. Diet Coke, that's it. That's and, the one. And they, and they are, in fact, this is not putting it light, putting it you know overstated, but they are addicted to that. Sugar is an alien that lives inside your body and, and makes you make bad decisions. Yeah. 
It it really does. It it really impacts every decision that you make, and and that has been uh, that I I'm so glad that you are you're bullish on that particular angle of self care because it is the the people that I run into who are struggling with ADHD who are doing all the life hacks who are doing everything that they can to build the living systems around supporting their new habits and supporting their behaviors in ADHD and they wonder why isn't this working as they're pounding diet coke at five six seven nine nine o'clock at night, wondering why they can't get to sleep. Their ADHD, they say, is making them an insomniac. They can't get to sleep till three in the morning. Their brain doesn't sh- doesn't shut down. And if they would just stop and listen to their body, listen to the way their diet is impacting their behavior every single hour of the day, uh, it, it just feels so good to get that part under control. It's like opening the gates to opportunity of, of whatever can come next in your own life with ADHD. Yeah, and it's real. It really is a perfect paradox because all these things that we've been doing all along, you know, eating uh, candy, uh, soda, um, sugary stuff, caffeine to fuel us, uh, trying to work into the night to make up for the fact that I couldn't get that project done earlier. You know, earlier and now I have to get it done for tomorrow, and then not getting to sleep. These are all the things that ADHD has caused. And and at the same time, if we can undo those, those are the things that are going to make you actually less reliant on your medications and make you just a lot happier. Yeah. You uh, you offer and I, I, I uh, have to tell you, I don't know the five things that you are doing every day to make your ADHD worse. This is your free ebook that you can get at ADHD And everybody should do that. I wonder if you could leave us as a tease uh, one thing that you say you're doing every day that makes your ADHD worse and uh, how you help your clients get to the other side of that thing. You bet. Well, we did talk about sugar. That is one of the things, but I'll, I'll give you another one of them, and that is worry. Uh, we ADDers will tend to ruminate inordinately, again, in part because of the conditioning that we've had where you know, we're dummies. We don't do anything right. Why can't I work as, uh, as efficiently as my, the person in the cubicle next to me, et cetera. And we burn a lot of mental fuel on worry. Whereas if we took that same mental fuel, you know, when you get up in the morning, you've, you've got a, a tank of gas, right? And that tank of gas heads toward empty all day long. And if you are burning some of that fuel by worrying, that's fuel that you couldn't then use to go and, you know, attack that project that you've been putting off, et cetera. So worry is a big one. One thing that I'll, I'll leave you kind of a, maybe a homework assignment is after this podcast, just actually sit down quietly and just listen to your thoughts, <laughs> Just listen to your thoughts. It's a weird exercise, but it's called being the witness. And just listen to some of the stuff that comes into your mind and be objective. Oh, there's that thought about that. Oh, there's that worry about where, what I'm going to do later today. Da, da, da. And you will find that 99% of the stuff that is in your head is worry about the past. It's anxiety about the future. And it's a lot of BS judgments about this and that. And if you just got attuned or rather tuned in to that reality, you would it explodes your ability again to be the witness and to start to question all this crap that's going on in your head. And when you can get some of that junk out of your head, you can then go, okay, what do I need to do next? What's the next thing I need to do? And what do I need to do to get that done? I love that. I got a, I've got a quote up on my wall from David Mamet. Uh, this is by way of his, his uh, film, the Spanish prisoner. And uh, it's it's this quote. It says, uh, "Worry is interest paid on a debt that never comes due." Mm-hmm. And I have to remind myself of that every day because stress and anxiety and worry they creep in so fast uh, that uh, uh, boy, that's a that's a powerful it is a biggie uh, powerful message. Yeah, yeah. And there are there are three other things that you're doing every day. Uh, and trust me, you're doing them every day. Uh, <laughs> So I encourage you to get that ebook, and there there are frankly many other things that we do every day that make our agency worse. But we want to keep the ebook simple for folks. Yeah. So I hope you do go check that out. Absolutely, check that at ADD Crusher. Can you tell us about the brain hacks? Yes, I was just going to say, Alan, you have to talk about Crusher TV and these brain hacks. You bet. And Nikki, thank you again for being an awesome guest on the show. Um, you know, um, I created AD, ADD Crusher. These are the instructional videos for teens and adults. I created those five years ago. Um, because when I was first diagnosed, I, I, as I mentioned, I bought a bunch of books and opened them up and I said, oh, that's right. I can't read. And I couldn't figure out why they weren't 
videos or at least audios to teach coping strategies for these ADHDers who really don't read or really just have visual spatial uh, processes and learning processes. Well, um, I, I learned something from Dr. Ed Hollowell with whom I did a thing in uh, London called um, Habit, H-A-B-Y-T. It was uh, uh, a, 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 um, a virtual webinar that we did together uh, last year. And he said that 50% of the people that knock on the door of his practice are not, in fact, ADHD. They are ADT, what he calls attention deficit trait. And I thought, wow, th- and those ADT people may be part of that 85%, but what Hallowell is saying is that they're really just crazy busy people that are totally overwhelmed. And I wanted to bring my brain hacks, which is mostly what I teach in the ADD Crusher videos, I wanted to bring those to a wider population. So I created Crusher TV, which is not about ADHD per se, it's just about unleashing the power of your brain by way of productivity brain hacks. And uh, just very briefly, a brain hack, we all know what a computer hacker does. He, he goes into someone else's system and throws some switches to gain some kind of advantage. Well, a brain hack is just you going into your own brain and throwing a couple of really simple switches. It could be a little bit of diet, but more often it is just changing the way you view something that opens the door to action tears down the doors uh, of procrastination Uh, just by flipping a switch in your brain. That's what a brain hack is. Great explanation and great resource uh, on your website. You've got got a lot of stuff going on there. So beyond the book, go get the book, everybody. Five things you are doing every day that make your ADHD worse, addcrusher.com. You can jump over to, uh, uh, I've got the uh, undiagnosed and at-risk TED Talk uh, in the show notes. Uh, You've got Crusher TV. You've got to check out Crusher TV. Anything else that we're missing? Uh, that that you are doing right now because it sounds like there's probably a long list. Well, no, I'm just doing. I'm doing a lot of speaking, and um, you know, we we do have a, a book that's that's sort of underway. But uh, you know, <laughs> every ADD or has a book that's underway. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to talk about that one. I'll give you the title. It's called The Jersey Buddha. Uh, nice. And, uh, it, it involves F, F-bombs, so I can't read the subtitle of it. <laughs> because it is, after all, The Jersey Buddha. But we're, we're working on that on the side. But um, just doing a lot of as much getting the word out as I can. My biggest concern, of course, is that 85%. And, I, and I'll leave you with this thought. If you, as a, as a diagnosed ADD or know one other person who's diagnosed with ADHD, that one other person that you know represents only 15% of the total adults that are, that are ADHD. So there are probably six other adults with ADHD that you know that aren't diagnosed. So know that the, the, the people that are, should be at the vanguard of helping to get that 85% into our tribe uh, are us, the 15%. So I'll leave you with that. Alan Brown, thank you so much for your time and attention today. That's a fantastic message. Great to be here, and thank you both. Nikki, thank you, as always, for your time. Uh, it is a treat. I love that we uh, we had this conversation today. Me too. It was great. It, Very informative. It was great. Alan, I hope you come back. I would love to come back, and thanks again, and thanks for the work that you guys are doing. Thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to this show. We uh, we hope you learned a lot from Alan, and that you'll check out all of his resources. On behalf of Alan Brown and Nikki Kinzer, I'm Pete Wright, and we will catch you next week right here on Taking Control the ADHD podcast.